Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Alana. And um, if you've been following me for any length of time, you will notice that the background is different. Your girl got a different setup. I was finally able to set up bookshelves and have most of my books in one spot. Get this hair off my neck, it's hot. Um, and yeah, I like the background better. It's so much cooler looking. I was working with what I had. There you go. This review, before I get into Duck's Newberry Port, warning, I hated it, couldn't even finish it, but we're going to talk about it anyway. Before I talk about Duck's Newberry Port, I'm going to go over what my, my updated summer reading plans are, so my July TBR and my August TBR. Let's swivel smoothly to the side. Eve Babbitt's ba uh, Black Swan. Black Swan, snap Black Swan, this is not Swan Lake. I would, had hoped to potentially get to this in June, but I was having delusions of grandeur, so that didn't happen. So this is getting pushed over to July. Short story collection. I think they're more like short essays. They say stories, but I think there is some nonfiction mixed into it, so we'll, we'll, we'll say and blend. Paul by Daisy Lafarge is another one that I had, you know, the delusion that I was going to be able to get to it this July hair poking me in my eye. Ow. Or sorry, this June that didn't happen. So I'm pushing this forward to July. This shouldn't take me that long to get through. Um, but yeah, I don't really see many people talking about this book. So it's about a very toxic relationship and a creepy relationship. We'll see how that goes. Um, ooh, a buddy read with Kieran. If you know Kieran, he's on YouTube. Um, if on a winter's night, a traveler by Calvino. I'm excited about this one. Um, so this is a buddy read. I have, this is my first Calvino. So we'll see how that goes. My bedtime read for the month of July, which will probably get pushed into August because it is 600 pages long. It is finally getting to this. I purchased this like two years ago. Um, six Tudor Queens, starting with Catherine of Aragorn. So Aragorn, I said Aragorn because if you don't know, Aragorn in Lord of the Rings is one of my favorite male characters of all time. The man's a stud. He is. What this collection is, you can see them here. I'm missing the sixth one. I need to go ahead on and complete the collection. But Alison Ware, who has written, she's very knowledgeable of the Tudor period. I believe she's actually a historian. And so she now writes nonfiction and she does write fiction based on the Tudors. And so she completed, a, or did a collection of, or a series of six books, each one from the perspective of one of Harry, the Henry Harry, ooh, Freudian slip, Henry the Eighth's wives. So finally getting around to this, starting with his first wife, Catherine. Um, this one is 600 pages, but it's again, it's historical fiction. And from what I've heard, these books are pretty compulsively readable. She's actually, now that she's completed that series, she's actually going in with a trilogy from the perspective of Henry VIII. And the first book I believe is published this summer. But let me let me get through these, which is gonna take a decade. But you know, we'll, we'll see. And I also have some Philip Gregory back here that I need to jump into, but anyway. My main read, <laughs> this piece of Marmite, my main read of July is gonna be Q1984 by the infamous Murakami. I know people who hate this book and I know people who love this book. I think I'm actually going to love it. I like weird fiction. I do. I like f fiction that is sometimes uh, like Marmite. And so my friend Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space, who you should subscribe to because she's so nice. Um, and she's one of my friends, book friends, that... We discovered we discovered each other through booktube or bookstagram actually bookstagram and we've become like real life friends but anyway karen also by katie books katie reads i think his youtube and his instagram handle are one of the two he they're not the same but it's one of the two karen was like alana you need to read this i <laughs> he read it and he surprisingly really liked it so um i'm excited to get into this and this is my first murakami and so yes those are july reads i need to wrap this up i'm five minutes in um, August reads, this is what I'm looking at. Um, Rules of Civility 
by Amor Tolls. I really enjoyed A Gentleman in Moscow. And so I'm excited to venture into Rules of Civility. Um, there is a person I follow on Instagram who um, was reading this book. And she said it's very quintessential New York City. And I love a good, new, authentic New York City novel where you can just, you're, you're in the city. That's what it, a novel that feels like that. The last Persephone on my shelf that I have unread is The Far Cry by Emma Smith. I only own six Persephones currently and I've read them all except this one. I believe this one takes place a young English teenager woman or something and she goes to India. So we'll read this and after this book, <laughs> um, that means I'm going to need to get more Persephones. Okay. I don't, okay, if you are not in the UK... And because there is a Persephone Books bookstore in London and getting them shipped straight from Persephone's website is expensive and the price has gone up exponentially post 2020. So Blackwell's ships to the United States and Canada. So if you're in North America and you can get Persephone's books for like $10 cheaper than if you were to get them shipped from Persephone because the shipping is insane. So that's where I will be getting my Persephone's moving forward. I have a rom-com. This isn't really a rom-com. This is just a contemporary romance. I don't think this book is particularly supposed to be funny, but it's. I have not read Christina Lauren yet. Love in Other Words, it sounded like something that I would potentially get on with. So if you don't know, I don't read much romance, but I'm changing that. I am putting in romance within my TBR and my rotations, and I've been enjoying it thus far. I read People We Meet on Vacation um, back in May. Spoiler alert, I actually really, really enjoy People We Meet on Vacation. Um, I can't wait to do that review. And I just finished The Flat Chair by Beth O'Leary, which I also really enjoyed. So this rom-coms and contemporary romance is still a little bit outside of my comfort zone, but I'm getting used to the fact, or I'm getting used to putting in books that are outside of my comfort zone, exposing myself to different genres. And the books like this just are really nice palate cleansers. Um, when after reading something like, I don't know, an 800 page Victorian classic. Ah, starting the Farseer trilogy with Assassin's Apprentice. This book will not take me long to get through. I have ooh, poking me in my eye. It's not even 400 pages long. Ooh, 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 hype, hype, hype. And I'm so glad that total, there are five other books that they're that completely complete, completely complete. Because uh, I've heard that, ooh, I've heard that is good. So fantasy. Oh, Game of Kings. Also hype. This book I've heard is so good. The description cause it like cause it or the the blurb in the back is combining all the political intrigue of Game of Thrones with the sweeping romanticism of Outlander. <coughs> Something went down the wrong pipe. Anyway, with that blurb, your girl had to get it. But I've heard that. This is not the easiest read to get into. Uh, Dorothy Dunnett shows and doesn't tell you. So you, there are a lot of references to really old pieces of literature and stuff from because this book is taking place in 1547. So yeah, she does not dumb it down for the reader. And so there is an accompanying guide to this book, which I will be reaching for but I've heard once you get into the flow and you get used to it it's so good this is also one of Burke one of six enough rambling I gotta get into Duck's Newburyport and why I hate it so much there are no quotes in this review if you've one second I typically quote books to that I read and the reason why I like to quote provide quotes in my reviews is because to kind of back up the claims that I'm making about why I'm pick, picking up on certain themes or whatever and, and the themes that are the quotes that support how I decided to take the, re the direction I decided to take the review. I don't have any quotes for this book because I, I just, this is actually, it's a review, but it's a rant. I know that I have some people who are fans of that. Um, I can see why this book is so... If I remember to, in the description, I'm going to put in two reviews 
that also pretty much felt the same that way I felt that are on YouTube. Now, there are people who liked this book and but if you go on if you Instagram, if you go on Goodreads, you go and look at the Amazon reviews, it is like psh, and I'm not the only one who's claiming why I hated why I hated this book. Same reasons. Um, there are people who like this book who still say that the reasons why people hate this book, it annoyed them, but they still like the book. Okay, so Duck's Newbury Report. I DNF'd this book. I almost never DNF. I can push through almost anything, but my patience is not infinite. This book is my edition. Also, look, I don't even have to hold up my books anymore. <clears throat> Say less. Okay, Ducks Newburyport. This book, my edition. Side note, the cover is immaculate. I love the cover. It's great. Insides, not so much. 988 pages long. If I'm going to slog through a book that long, it better be good. It better be good. It's. I stopped at page 289. Because once you get to that point, you get the book. The book is too long. Okay. The fact that <laughs> I also, you, if you know me, I tend to really enjoy a big, thick, chunky book. Right now I'm reading a 720 page Victorian classic, Lorna Dune by R.D. Blackmore. So good. QT84. I'm excited. I love a thick book. I'm here for the ride. This book is too long. That is my first complaint of this book. It is unnecessarily long it is so long to the point where i it feels like elman made it that long because she could and i feel like she's trolling the reader and i'm not the only one who has said this and i now understand why people are saying this this novel is very interior so it's written from the perspective of a ohian housewife circa pre-2020 but the late 2010s is what i'm guessing just because yeah late 2010s because of there are certain references that she's making about who's in the white house which we'll get into later it's just so i'm probably probably circa 2017 2019 esque she bakes and sells pies but she's a housewife but she does have her own baking business the reader is in her head the entire time and it's structured in this strange stream of consciousness esque style and she's and I'm, I'm going to get to why it's strange later. She's musing over her husband. This is her second marriage and also her uh, former husband, her ex-husband, her four children. They have pets, American culture, American society and politics, memories. She discusses a lot about her mother. Her mother has since deceased. And so one thing that you will realize is that it's this very painstakingly slow build up to how her mother passed away and i'm gonna go ahead and say when you i knew how her mother passed away anyway before i got into this book so it wasn't a particular spoiler for me but the build up for an almost 1000 page novel when you get to that point is infuriating you're like that's it you built up 1000 pages for that okay and so you also get these random words, movies, food, etc. These, the, the book is technically written in eight sentences. No, and there are sections and each massive section is one sentence, which when you first think of the premise of this book, it's like, yeah, that's cool. Let's try it out. It's a bit experimental, right? Mm. When there is a break in these massive sections, these women's thoughts, this woman's thoughts, rather, she's one person, <laughs> debatable, is paralleled with the plot of a female mountain lion. It is very clear from page three of this novel, another reason why it doesn't need to be 1,000 pages long is because very, very early on, I'm talking within the first three to five pages, you understand that the mountain lion symbolizes this woman and vice versa with the themes of motherhood and survival and because this goes on in such a repetitive way back and forth and also these women's stream of consciousness thoughts about what she's thinking about are so repetitive 
and ev- almost everything repeats itself multiple times. It's so, un- it's, it's just irksome. It's not even annoying. It's irksome. I loathed it. It's just, stop talking. Um, this doesn't, this book does not need to be this long to make the points that she's making about the death of her mother, the grief and processing that death, the buildup to get to the death of her mother, the parallel with the mountain lion. We don't need it. We do not need it to be 1000 pages long at all point blank period. It's too long. Oh, and like I said, a lot of her thoughts repeat themselves and I get it. When you're in your own head, you repeat a lot of the same thoughts over and over again. I get it. She should have still done that in 350 pages. We are, I mean, we, all of us obsessively think of, about certain things over and over again. I get it. I get it. But I don't want to read it. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, if this book had been 300 to 350 pages long, the point could have been way, been way, made way sooner. The structure actually of the novel could have remained the same. The random lists of words that you get and all of this commentary and her her background, her marriages, her kids, her mother, all of it could have been done in 300 to 350 pages. But the most important elements are sandwiched with just the most mundane, pointless thoughts that again, repeat themselves at nauseum. That's, um, it's just too long. If it had been shorter with the same structure, it would have been way more impactful. It is more difficult to be decise, to be concise than wordy. And again, I think that she did this just because she could and because it was different. And people were like, yo, let's publish that at 1,000 pages. All right, moving forward. The fact that this is a contemporary novel set in the 21st century, like I said, circa probably between 2017 to 2019, say circa 2017, 16, Donald Trump is in office. Let's just put it that way. We'll get to that. I'm about to go in. All right. So yes, because it's a contemporary novel set in the, tw- the, uh, the t- late teens of the 20th century, 21st century, I'm going to expect political conversations, current affairs, social commentary. I'm going to expect it. I expect that in almost every contemporary novel that I pick up because isn't that what the classics are doing? Yeah, people are talking about the day and time in which they live. But oh my goodness, the political statements in this book are infuriating partially because they are so repetitive and extremely one-sided. The amount of times that Donald Trump is mentioned in this book in the, in the little bit less than 300 pages that I read is again, infuriatingly obnoxious because it is so repetitive. We get it. You don't like Trump. I don't give two flips about Trump. The man doesn't live in my head rent free. Do I like him? I could care. I don't like any politicians for the most part. No politician lives in my head when free. Want to know why? Because almost all of them, 99.999% of them are, are probably shady and unethical and immoral. Okay. But the fact that she just rags, and I'm talking about Elman, rags on the man and his wife over and over. We get it. You don't like Trump. Let it go. I feel like most Americans especially are sick and tired of hearing the name Trump. Can we just move on? <laughs> Kieran and I were talking about this book. He's Welsh. He was like, I got sick of hearing the name Trump. That's how much he is in this book. And I'm going to say something. If an author had ragged on the Obamas and commented on the appearance of Michelle Obama, the way that she talks about the appearance of Melania Trump, if she had done that, I'm playing devil's advocate. Let's call a spade a spade. If anybody had done that to the Bidens, which will, <laughs> or Obama, And his wife, oh, they would have canceled her, hands down. So, you know, it's just annoying. And to me, I don't care how much I don't give a flip about a lot of these politicians. I just have a boundary. I'm just not going to rag on somebody's wife like that. That's the first former first lady of the United States. I'm just not going to do it. I think it's disrespectful whether I like you or not. But she couldn't rag on Michelle Obama like that because if you do, you're a racist. But okay. It's just annoying. It's almost like, can we let it go? Okay. We are, again, we are sick and tired of hearing about Trump. We're sick of it. And it's just, she just goes on and on and on. And it's just not adding anything. Trump, 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 Trump. Let it go. Okay. These politicians don't even know you breathe air. Okay. 
And Biden ain't no better. These people are corrupt, all of them. Left wing, right wing, same bird. I heard a, a really well-known psychologist say that it, once you get to the federal level, especially, most of these people, especially world leaders who are leading a country, who are the face of a country, what they often had to do to get to that point, you wouldn't like any of them. So let's move forward, okay? These people don't live in my head room free. No, no, none of these people are my savior. These people didn't die for you. Okay. The fact that as a history major who wrote her graduating thesis around the, on the American Revolution, I was infuriated by some of the statements that are made in this book about American history. It's very inaccurate. It's politically charged. It is identity politics charged, and it's inaccurate. There are debates. It's, it's, these conversations and statements are way more nuanced than it's just political talking points. Um, for example, no, the Star Spangled Banner, which is this country's anthem, is not inherently racist. The reason why you may see articles claiming that the Star Spangled Ban Banner is racist is because the term slave appears in the lyrics. So there are actual historical documents or, or documentaries by historians breaking down why the Star Spangled Banner is the way that it is and what it is from. What's it based off of? A historical event, okay? So people here see the word slave and they get triggered. The Star Spangled Banner is a, really about the United States, the colonies, versus Britain. Being a slave to tyranny. It is not talking about bodies in trade. Okay? Stop it. Slave can mean multiple things. It has multiple definitions, depending on context, which this book has no context whatsoever. And if you look at the linguistic usage of the word slave during that period, yes, oftentimes it is talking, yes, you can have slave bodies, right? There is not a country on this planet that has not had slaves at one point in its time, period. Oh my gosh, I'm so irritated. So yes, it is talking about political, tyrannical, governmental slavery, not a transportation of bodies against their will. That's not what we're talking about here. So, and I'm gonna say this, clearly as you can see, I'm not white. Surprise, didn't think, I'm not white. When, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. I find it annoying when groups of people, certain groups of people, they tend to be, I'm just gonna say this, I hate it when there are people who claim things to be racist towards people of color when oftentimes the people of color could care less. Don't speak for me. Don't speak for us. There are people who would, you know, some people, can, no, no group, no people group is a monolith, okay? Stop speaking for groups of people because you feel a certain way. Speak for yourself, okay? And even within a group of people, the black community, Native American community, Hispanic community, the, you know, whatever. Very diverse, okay? Very diverse. We don't all think the same way. There are people of color, Native Americans, Latinos, Latinas, African Americans, etc., Asian Americans, who have died for this country all the way back up pre-American Revolution. There are people of color, Native Americans and African Americans who fought in the American Civil War, both on the side of the South, yes, and on the side of the Union. And so people have died for this country of all colors. Back to the colonial times. And so um, many of us who which still revere and, you know, think that the Star Spangled Banner is the, this country's anthem and should be treated as such, regardless of a country's history. So, yes, stop. As one of my middle school history teachers would say, you are loud and you are wrong. Right? Every country has its woes. Let's chew up the fish and spit out the bones. One of my favorite quotes that I heard recently is this, was when you look in, the, when you keep looking in the rearview mirror, you can't drive straight. Let's stop getting distracted. History is history. Acknowledge it. Research it, understand it, 
and keep moving forward. Because if you keep looking at the past, you can't think towards the future. And this book is just political identity nonsense. And I'm sick of it. The fact that this woman goes on and on about things in American society in the most narrow-minded news headline way. And this is kind of stemming off what I just talked about. It goes on and on about, it goes on about guns. It goes on about the police and race. Again, so repetitive that it's annoying. It's very, very one side of the spectrum. And I felt like I was reading inflated news lines from legacy media. Um, and I got her point very quickly, very quickly. But it's so repetitive. Again, I do not like it when groups of people are lumped in together with no nuance. Again, no group is a monolith. Not all police officers are the same. I have friends and colleagues who are police officers and they really care about their jobs. They care about keeping the community safe. They, and they're making very little money for what they do. Again, not all officers are bad. Not all people. She also go, there's a lot of like pro-choice, pro-life stuff. And just why people take a stance that they do is so complex very complex and so again i am not i i j stop grouping groups of people together so as i'm gonna say then all police officers are the same all people who are pro-life or pro-choice are not the same all democrats are not the same all republicans are not the same all independents are not the same not all white people are the same not all people of color in various groups are not the same And it's just so annoying. And I can now, it, it's, it's just a lot of the statements are inaccurate and they're not nuanced. And you can tell that Elman is really actually pushing her own points of view, which, okay, you can do. It's your book. You can do what you want. But it's just annoying. And I can see how people have said when this book was published that this book is not going to date well because it's just, she, it's just not going to date well. Which, playing devil's advocate, this book is really a snapshot of a certain place and time in America political, American political and social history, if you will. Um, and you can see how what people were thinking about. Her thoughts are not uncommon. I'm just saying. Okay. But in four, four short years of this, four, what, four to five short years of this book being published, it's already dated. And I can see why many reviewers were saying this book was not, would not age well. And again, Americans, I'm going to say Americans, I cannot speak for any other country's political climate. Aren't we tired of this? Are we tired of this very black and white thinking? No pun intended. Very, you know, one-sided thinking, or if you're this way, you're automatically over here. If you think this, you're automatically over there. Most people are actually moderate, maybe slightly right or slightly left to center, depending on the view, <laughs> depending on the issue. Aren't we tired of this? This is how, aren't we tired of it? I'm tired of it. Um, I think this book actually would have been more interesting if it was... The, the voice, the narrator was either politically neutral or independent and, and discussed things in a more moderate way, because I think it would have been a more interesting snapshot of a spectrum. But again, the author chose what she wanted to do so she can do that. I just don't have to like it. Um, I just felt like a lot of it also was quite contrived. And I felt like I was reading a political slash commentary opinion piece rather than a novel. And it was just, I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm really over a lot of this division. It's just, it's just, it's just getting to a point where it's just, it, I would argue that the United States is actually in a culture war. The fact that the, that the stream of consciousness is awkward. No one thinks like this. No one. No one lists these random things in their head the way that it's done in here. There are obscure words and, con and attempt at connections that are made that are very awkwardly done. And again, quite contrived. Also, some of the connections to get from point A to point B, again, awkward. 
contrived. She, it feels like the author is trying too hard and or she's doing it because she's she can and she's like, hey, look what I just did. Aren't I so smart? Like, I feel, I feel like I'm not the only one who said that you read this book and you feel like the author's trolling you. I, yeah. Um, I see why, as much as I don't like calling books pretentious, because what does that mean? I, it's kind of vague. I can see why people call this book pretentious. Some people call books like A Little Life pretentious, The Idiot by Elif Bodiman pretentious. This book would give those a run for its money. If you wanted to call it pretentious. Okay. I can see why many a reader has said they felt played reading this book. I felt, I too, I felt played. The fact that this re this narrator is annoying. This woman isn't likable. She's not. I don't, and I don't need my characters to be likable. Actually, I love to hate a good, unlikable character. And especially if they're written well, ooh, you know that they're horrible, but you like them anyway. Good example. If you are familiar with the Poldark series, George is the main villain of the Poldark series by Winston Graham. And, but George is such a good villain. You love to hate him. And there are many other characters. Jane Austen's a good one. There are characters that you just love to hate. This woman is just annoying. Okay. Um, I actually listened to this book via audio while reading the hard copy along with it and it was just I don't know I just couldn't take it anymore I, again by the time I get to pay it got to page 289 I was like I can't take it with this woman's I can't take it anymore I'm so done with this woman's voice the narration style even if I was reading the hard copy of it just the narration style again the repetitiveness I got the point. I was I was over it. So I was like, I'm not wasting my time anymore. I get I get it. Um, this woman is very self-centered, which I get the point. We're in her head. If any of us were to have our thoughts put on an audiobook, we would all look self-centered. Let's be real. We would all be self-centered. But it's just <clears throat> this woman is not likable. She's just she's just annoying. Okay. We would not, me and her, we wouldn't be friends. We would not be friends. Um, it's hard to describe. She comes across as a bit whiny and woe is me. And I, my personality type, I, I can't get on with that. Girl, a spine, move on with your life. I need, she just, we wouldn't be friends. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. The fact that I will be ridding my house of this book once I'm done with this review, it is getting chucked i'll probably give it away to you know the thrift store or something but it, it's got it's it's getting out of this house asap i'm done i'm so glad i'm done with the review the reviewing process it, it's, it's got to go that book is thick you see how thick this thing is this is a door stopper taking up the, i can put three books on a shelf for this one it's got to go wasting my wasted space all right um I get what Elman is doing here. I don't like it. It's too long. It, the fact that it is just too long. Let me make one thing clear about this book. Elman could have kept everything the same. Everything that I didn't like. The Donald Trump going on at nauseum. The very one-sided political views. The inaccurate historical statements. All of it could have stayed the same. If she had made this book shorter, I would have given it a way higher rating just for the fact that it is actually an interesting piece of fiction the way that it's constructed. I don't really like it. I get that it, I get what she's doing. I do not believe that she just threw words on a page. I do think that she had to take some research when it comes to synonyms and antonyms and words that sound a certain way together. I get all of that. It, this did take effort. I'm not going to say that it didn't. Because it actually, there is a plot. Well, there is a timeline and she's sinking this woman's stream of consciousness to a timeline. I get it. If it had been shorter, I would have given it a way higher rating. 1,000 pages? Are you kidding? Throw it away. Not literally. Just give it away. Give it away. Actually, I think I know people who threw this book away. Karen threw a, a cinnamon roll at it. Can't say. Blame him. I'm definitely going to leak his review uh, uh, below. It is immaculate. Um, and also because it, it's, it's, it's experimental. Again, if this had been a third of the size, 
I would have given it probably at least a three, but it does not need to be 1000 pages. At this point, it seems like you're gloating. And I'm a patient reader, but I'm not that patient and I'm not going to get played. I don't need it. I have limits when it comes to personal self-torture, right? I, I, I dance on point for fun. Are you kidding? No, get rid of it. The fact that if I read the fact that one more time in this book, that's the thing. The fact that, the fact that this, almost like how when you read Slaughterhouse-Five, so it goes is this reoccurring phrase in the book. It's the fact that is a reoccurring phase, phrase in this book. I'm throwing the book across the street if I read this one more time and I want to back it over with my all-American gas guzzling muscle car. And I'm pretty sure that if I did such, the narrator would clasp her pearls and gasp because how dare I as an American not always throw shade at my country. Okay. I will say this. I'm all about critiquing countries and, and, and things, but you can't control where you're born. You know what I mean? So as an American, I acknowledge the good, the bad, and the ugly of this country. And, but I appreciate my country for what it is. I can't, I, I was born here. I have no choice. And also as a history major, my hair is looking crazy. As a history major, yeah, I, I've studied some stuff. But, you know, you can't control where you're born. And there are, as, people, as much as people like to dog certain things, you have to acknowledge that there's good and bad to everything. Um, and so I like to look at the country holistically. Um, every single country on this earth has its horrid bits. Horrid. You go back to ancient times. Go back to A.D., B.C. times. Every country has sordid history. Every single one. So um, I don't hold grudges. I just learn my history and I move forward. Okay. Um, you chew up the fish and you spit out the bones. And so, again, when you keep looking back, it distracts from the now. So I might as well just go ahead on and strap a bald eagle in my car and wave the American flag out my window of my all-American car. Sure will. I just... I have other things to do. I'm being facetious, but I have other things to do and just sit there and like hate on things all day with nonstop. Your girl got bills to pay. All right, I'm being facetious. Let's move forward. This book was obviously a hard no for me. I'd rather read Conversation with Friends by Sally Rooney three times in a row. I am not kidding. I'd rather read Sally Rooney. This is how much I hated this book. Um, and I, 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 I'm so glad that I decided to DNF it. I tried to push through. I couldn't push through this book. I would rather read Sally Rooney. Conversations with Friends, as much as I load that book, you can watch my review, is a better book than this. <laughs> I hated it. Um, never again. I know why so many people feel the way they feel about this book, why they hate it so much. There are people who love it. I have, uh, I know some bookish acquaintances who love this book. Again, it just goes to show that, you know, what is one person's yuck is another person's yum. Don't let me yuck your yum, all right? I hated it. One out of five. I think for me... As a, an American who is politically homeless, <laughs> I'm politically homeless. Um, I have strong views about things, but I don't like to get caught up in this war of the, 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 the binary political system that we have. And I listen to various points of view, um, but I don't make my politics my identity. <laughs> I find stuff like this to be annoying. Um, I, I'm, I'm a deeper thinker than that. Yeah, I'm throwing shade. I'm a deeper thinker than that. I don't think binary in that way. I don't think binarily about politics. Um, I, so I'm politically homeless. And so books like this, it can, um, it can get wrecked. One out of five. I'm done. Have you read books, Nary, books, uh, books? Have you read Dex Newburyport? If so, what were your thoughts? If you loved it, please share with me why you loved it. Because again, don't let me yuck your yum. I know that I love books that other people hate. Um, this one was just not for me and I'm getting rid of it. If you like this review or you didn't like it, like it, like it or don't like it. Do you? Um, let me know your thoughts below. Um, yeah. When I posted this review on Face, no, sorry, Instagram, there are people like, oh, yeah, I know people who like this book but still complain about the same exact things you complained about. So I'm like, cool. Interesting 
combination. But again, don't let me yuck your yum. <laughs> Please feel free to follow me on Instagram where I get up to more bookish shenanigans. That's actually where I post all of my reviews first. Um, YouTube is way behind Instagram for my book content. I also post my monthly TBRs and my reading wrap ups there and funny memes because again, that's what the internet is for. A good hearty laugh. So I will see you in the next one. I need to calm down. Bye.